Assalamu alaikum. I didn't print out any papers this, to, uh, this week. I'm sorry. I'll make sure. Sorry, that I was here last week. I meant to be here. No, no problem. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man ittaqa. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair for everybody coming out here today. Barakallah people. I hope you guys are very excited for your class. Yes, we are. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah fikum. I'm excited for it too. And it's even more exciting because we're close to Ramadan. Okay, and I want to put the context of our class in the context of right before Ramadan and what we're doing. To, this is all in preparation for Ramadan in reality. I don't mean to be uh, saying this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, you know, but we've done a lot of things incorrectly, okay? And one of the things that we have done incorrectly here is we've turned Ramadan into like a family reunion type thing, a festival, a, every day is a, is a party type thing. And whereas we're supposed to enjoy being around each other, this is no doubt an objective of Salatul Jumu'ah, this is what Salatul Juma is supposed to be a weekly gathering. And those of you guys who are older than me knew that when we were growing up, we lived around our peoples. And if not during the weekends, we got around our peoples, okay? At least once or, or twice a month on the weekends and everything like that. If that's if you didn't live around each other. So Islam has that in place with Salatul Juma. That we're supposed to make time, no matter what our schedule is, to make sure that we are free at that time to spend time with one another. And especially in the States, it's vital and important that the women also come to us, even though it's not fardu ain, because otherwise you'd have no interaction with the community, right? If, it were the only, if you never came or to Juma. And Mama used to say what? The family that prays together stays together, right? So we have to put that into context that Salatul Juma is the weekly gathering. We sit around and enjoy Jack and after Salatul Juma and eat food and laugh and joke and everything, then get serious for the rest of the week. But Ramadan is not that. Okay? Ramadan is not that. And by doing that, by getting together after we break your fast, you're already tired. Okay? Ramadan is a marathon. Okay? It's a marathon. Now, we don't get hungry after maybe the second day. But we do feel tired, okay? We do feel some thirst. And now we don't want to eat, we don't have that desire, but it still affects our activity, our ability to do certain things. And what injures us more is after we break our fast, we do some, a few things incorrectly, and I just want to point them out. One thing we do incorrectly, we eat too much. We said, I didn't get my third. No. We're not supposed to, it's not our third, it's up to one third. You don't have to fill it up to one third. It's not like, okay, this is, I'm entitled to up, up to one third. You don't stop starting at one third. You get the point? So we eat too much, which affects us erroneously. It affects us and gives us poor health. Or most of our uh, immune system is tied to the bottom of our stomach area. So then all those blood and all that energy goes there and it makes us give us the itis. We can't stand up and pray, can we? Because we don't, we don't have it. You know, Abu Bitna, they say, the father of the belly. Some men look like they're pregnant. Okay? So, alhamdulillah, you know I mean? So first thing, we don't want to eat too much. The next thing we want to remember not to do is we don't want to talk too much. Okay? Because we didn't come to the masjid to Georgia. Okay? Not for Ramadan. We came to recite Qur'an and to study the Qur'an throughout the month of Ramadan. And people are distractions to that. Okay? People come, and I know this happened, man or the lady come to the masjid with the full intention to sit down and read Qur'an after they finish their eating and get ready to go over the rest of that juice that they just got a little bit more to go through to keep on schedule. And then somebody sits next to them, Abdullah or Matullah, and starts talking. And you can't be rude, so you think, okay? And so you start talking to it, then you get off schedule and you don't finish the Qur'an. Because by the time you get home now, you're tired because you have to, especially the ladies, they work harder than the men. Because while we're sleeping, waiting for suhoor, they're up making suhoor. Right? So we have to go to bed. So we're tired so we can get up 
And we don't want to miss Sahur. I used to miss Sahur when I was young, when I was 20s. Now I don't miss Sahur. <laughs> I got to get me something to drink, a little bit of something to go on. So what I'm trying to say is it's a marathon that you have to plan and keep to your plan. And if we all understand this going in and you prepare for those difficult conversations saying, pardon me, sir, pardon me, ma'am, I really got to do this reading. Please. And you position yourself so that you're not open to speak, like facing the wall. When I had an office, you know, at, at school, at Islamic school in Kansas City, I took my, my, my desk and I made it face the wall so someone came in, I had to turn all the way around. And they see, and I would sometimes turn back around to like, like uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you. You get it? Because I couldn't do my job, you know, with my books to, the, to, the, to, the, to my back. So we have to do those types of things and just make it aware that we should be prepared for that. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, and hopefully we'll get through Ramadan fulfilling the objectives that we set for ourselves. Inshallah ta'ala. That's number one. And the number one objective of Ramadan is to end Ramadan knowing more meaningful meanings of the Quran than you did when you started. Because the Quran is our ammunition, okay? That we use to argue with our egos. Okay, when we have that, we're talking back and forth. The ego in your head is talking to the intellect in the heart. And whichever one has more proofs wins. Okay? One that has more proofs is gonna win. The ego in the head says everybody's doing it. Gives all the modern, modern reasons. It's, not, it's a new era, right? And the heart says, but we're supposed to be on the sunnah, right? Man, come on. This is 2000, whatever. You get the point? So when we have more proofs from the Quran, then the heart can <laughs> shut that down. Say, hey, listen, this makes more sense, doesn't it? So what we're doing is there's three things that people don't understand. Usul al-fiqh, I'm sorry, usul al-tafsir, qawaid al-tafsir, and tafsir. Let's go that again. Usul al-tafsir, say that. Usul al-tafsir. Usul al-tafsir are the fundamentals of tafsir. The roots, the ground, of the, the, the pit that you dig before you build that big building on it. You excavate the land, right? Remove the rocks and the roots out of there so you have a, a firm foundation. Usul tafsir is not tafsir. Okay? And nor is it qawaidu tafsir. Qawaidu tafsir are the rules of tafsir. That's like the infrastructure of a city or the, the construction before they put the, the walls on there and they put the rooms and the windows and the paint, right? What is that? That frame? What is that called? Any of you guys that know buildings? What is that called? It's called, frame, it's the, called frame. the frame. That is the framework is the qawaid tafsir the rules of tafsir. And then there's tafsir. That would be all the beauty you see inside the house. The windows, the paint, the carpet, the rooms, the furniture, right? Even the shelves. Okay? Now, what is usul tafsir? Usul tafsir takes you from being a novice to becoming a beginner to becoming an arif, to becoming an alim. Familiarity, it gives you history. That's what we're doing here. We're doing usul tafsir. Things to get you to know more about that book, okay? And the one that we use, the green Mosaf, it has 604 pages. We know how come the noon is big. This is telling you about the book. We know the book has the first Sit, uh, we saw the first nine surahs, not counting Surah Al-Baqarah, but up, I'm not, not counting Surah Al-Fatiha, but up to Surah Al-Tawbah, this is replacing the Torah. You see, we're learning things about the book, right? And the Mathani, what they are, these, the, these different ayat, went from Qaf going forward to the end of the Qur'an. This is different from the rest of the Qur'an. Is what Muhammad saw, so it came different from the other revelations, right? So we're learning more about the book. That there are some Meccan surah, some Medin. What is a surah? Walls around for the ayah? They surround. They surround. So we're getting to know that book better. There's 100 surah, surah plus 14, some? Some Medin. 
Okay, and so now we're going to learn why is it important to know Meccan surahs? Why is it important to know Medinan surahs? That's not done so much, so much in Usul al-Tafsir. But when we get to Kuwait the tafsir those are the rules that the Mufassir uses to determine what surah is Meccan and what surah is Medinan. You get the point? These are the rules that the, the Mufassir use to say this is an ayah of Tawheed. This is an ayah that is a dhikr, a qasas, a story, right? And stories make up half the Quran. Quran, right? So these are what those rules are. When we talk about the rules of Tafsir, we haven't studied that, and that's not the objective of our study. Okay? That's a study for those people who, be, who, who are planning to become Mufassirun. Okay? That's a specific you know, job title and a skill set. Now, tafsir is what we're going to do. With tafsirun 101 is what we're going to do. We're going to break each surah down for every one of you. From whence it came, it's, it's, name. its placement and just. It and that's what's important for us. And what it claims. So for us, where, where our starting point is to become familiar with a summary of each surah. When we, when we start to approach the surah, the first thing we should know is the fadl of that surah. Or, I'm sorry, the name of that surah, right? What's the name and what does that name mean? And why is it meaningful? Okay? Why does that name? What is, what's the benefit of that? This is real questions because, you know, we read the Qur'an so much, so much, so much, but we're not natadabbaru al-Qur'an. Everybody heard that before? No. Yes or no, guys? No. Yes. Okay, those who understand Arabic know that it's spoken in the Quran. Ponder over the Quran is translated. Have you heard it like that? I don't want to hear no whispering. Yes. yes. Okay, the word in Arabic is yatadabbaru. Anybody know what the root word is? Dubur. What does dubur mean? And he laughs because everybody... Everybody who thinks about it says, hold on, it must be a mistake. <laughs> Dubur is your backside. <laughs> your, your, the two cheeks, they call it now. Okay? Now, we say, well, what? It must, I must be translating this wrong. But there is a connection. You get to the bottom of it. Do you guys understand it now? Yet the dubbaru is get to the bottom. What does that mean? Because in Arabic, the, the stomach or the, the intestinal system, it doesn't stop with the stomach. It starts with the mouth and ends with the anus. So what is it? You're taking the food and you're tanawaluhu, right? When you learn something, tanawaluhu. You eat it. You embody it. What are you doing? You're chewing it up, breaking it down, taking it through the whole process, digesting it, embodying it, becoming part and process. And that's what Allah is telling us to do with the ayat. To think about it and consider it, every asset, break it down. Think of, get to the root, to the bottom of it. Ta ta the Quran. And you can't do that with just a mujarrid to read, just a plain read. We, we have to slow that read down and say, what is that? What actually am I talking about here? What is the theme of this surah? And now, once we identify the theme, what, what they do in teacher school, anyone went to teacher school, they tell you well, the first part of the lesson is the what? Gain attention. You don't get the attention, you can't teach. The next part is to tell the people the learning objective. Why? It's an hors d'oeuvre. It wets the palate. The mind it immediately starts to look for that. Right? He says, okay, today's learning objective is to find the theme of this surah, and somebody tells you the theme of the surah, I don't want to tell you guys right now, because I want you to be hungry, you know, when Ramadan comes, to hear, because seriously, then you'll soak it up. That's the problem, we get things too easy. We don't appreciate it, right? So then, I tell you the theme of the surah. Now what your mind is going to do, anybody going to tell me? What you going to do when you're reading? You're looking for it. Your mind is trying to find ways to connect that theme with everything that it's reading, right? And that's what's supposed to happen. Because then you'll find it. The mind works on conspiracy theories, right? Put this together and that together. And then we we'll start to see, oh, I see how this, this surah is pointing to that theme. 
especially after we summarize it and go through the sequential order of the Quran, of those surahs, and show how it leads up to that point, and how that point is consistent with the first point. This is called tafsir al-munasibat, which means a sequential order of tafsir, where it shows you the connection, okay, the nisbah, how it's all related to one towards the end. Does that make sense? And that's what our angle of tafsir is going to be in general. Because in this regard, we now walk away with meaningful information that we can now apply and make ilm. Because you know, information is not knowledge. What's the difference between information and knowledge? Knowledge changes behavior. Knowledge changes behavior. That's a good way of saying it. Because you know, knowledge is what you use. Okay? Because if it's just information, you know, then we could say that any college that has the tombs, you know, all those thousands of books they have in those tombs, those libraries, and they, they're the most knowledgeable people then, right? Because they got a lot of information. Oh, Google, he must be the greatest sheikh in the world. Right? Because he got a lot of information. So it doesn't make, just because the, the, the possession of the information doesn't make him knowledgeable. But being able to utilize that information. And that's why so many shiyukh have become shuyuk, but we don't know about them because they're taking that knowledge and utilizing it in their society or, in, or to other people. Then, then when they start using it to help and guide and everything like that, then we become known about those. We know those people. Does that make sense? Yes. So knowledge is what benefits, and when it benefits you and then it benefits others, that's the best of them. Kapish? Okay, so today our mission is to understand Meccan Surahs. Okay, we're in Usul Usul Tafsir. I love Usul Fiqh so much. Usul Tafsir. I keep mixing them, mixing the term. You know, Usul Tafsir. We're dealing with it. What is a Meccan Surah? And it's important for us to understand that to set the expectations. Okay, our expectations of what to do when we see it, what to expect from a Meccan Surah. So we begin the poem. We say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Eighty. Tafadum. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 82 before migration. 82 before migration. Meccan Surah sparked the nation. Meccan Surah sparked the nation. That's our opening line. Now, automatically from the beginning, you know how many Meccan Surahs are there? 82. 82. And what is a Meccan Surah? It came before migration. Migration, migration being Hijrah as a terminology. Okay? So Meccan Surahs spark the nation. What does that mean? What, what does it mean that Meccan Surahs spark the nation? Light it up. They, they, what is a spark? Okay, well, it, it, it's an ignition, right? It ignited them to do it. So this is the beginning. This is what put them into motion. Does that make sense? Yes. Sorry? Begins the existence of the of that this quote unquote nation, okay, and so that tells you the tone of the Meccan surahs. That the Meccan surahs, first of all, they came before migration. Now I want to make a point. There's twelve surahs of ikhtilaf amongst the senior scholar staff, meaning there's twelve surahs that there's ikhtilaf whether they are Meccan or Medinan. Why? I'll tell you that now. The reason why this ikhtilaf is because of the definition of a Meccan surah. Before migration, right? But migration was a year, wasn't it? So when some people will count when the migration started, when the Prophet said, okay, you can migrate to Medina. Well, that's migration. So those surahs that come after that, they count those as Medina. And others say, no, it's when the Prophet himself made it to Medina. All those sort of that happened after he ordered migration, we don't count them as Meccan or Medinan until he got to Medina, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You guys see the, the, yeah. the, the ikhtilaf? Yeah. That's just one of the reasons for the ikhtilaf. But one, one thing you should know about the sharia, there's a thing we call jaliyu sharia. Say jali. Jali. And khafi. And khafi. Now jali means that something is like jalla. You know, when nahari is that? Tajalla is bright and you can see it in all its apparentness. It's plain in your sight. The Jaliya Sharia, there's no ikhtilaf. There's nothing in the Sharia that's plain. Okay? The halal is clear. And the haram is 
clear. And between there's some things that people don't know about. Okay, not everybody may know about. So the thing about those things that are not so clear are not going to change your deen, are not going to do anything to, to decrease the quality of your iman. So you don't got to worry about it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So whether those surahs, those 12 surahs of iftilaf are Mecca or Medina, it doesn't change your ibadah. You guys get my word? So don't be fighting and pulling people's hair out, stabbing them, because they say this one is a Medina surah and you said it's a Mecca surah. It ain't that serious. You get the point, guys? Yes. All right. So 82 before migration. 82 before migration. Ah, no, no, that sounds like a Gatling gun. Come on, let's do it together. Bismillah. Bismillah. 82 before migration. 82 before migration. Meccan Surah sparked the nation. Meccan Surah sparked the nation. Inviting to Tawheedullah. Inviting to Tawheedullah. And not to worship Awliya. And not to worship Awliya. Now, that's what the first thing you notice about Meccan Surahs. They focus on Tawheed Allah, inviting, inviting to Tawheed Allah. The whole Quran talks about Tawheed in many different angles. But from this angle, you'll notice the Meccan surahs are inviting to the Tawheed Allah. Why? Because the people are not Muslim yet. Okay? The Medina surah is going to have a totally different tone. Yes. Okay? So it's inviting to Tawheed Allah. And not to worship. What's that? We use the term, so we have to define that term. That's prophet, saints, all types of shirt and inspiration for, for good, good work. work. So, awliya is the, the, is the plural of the word wali. Now, what is a wali? A wali is a prophet, and a wali is a saint. What's a saint? Because some people, wait, we have saints in Islam? Yes. The saints are the sahaba. A saint is someone whose <laughs> dua is answered. Now, do we know who is a saint besides the sahaba? No, we no. don't. There's a lot of people that have come and people have claimed these people are waliullah, friends of Allah, or someone. And sometimes when you see in the Quran, Allah infers that all the believers are awliya Allah, of Allah. Depending on where you are in the, in, in the quality of your deen and your ibadah and your relationship with Allah. And so Allah knows best. But for the most part, those people who are, we, we call the Sufis, they follow the different people or they make a grave for them. These are what we call out some of the people they call awliya, you know, because they worship them. Like Isa ibn Maryam. He's a wali of Allah, he's a, he's a nabi. But they worship him, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like Buddha, he may not be a prophet, he may be a prophet. Allahu a'lam, we have no delil. But people worship him. Yeah. And they follow him. You get my point? So we're not to worship awliya, that's prophets. I'm saying it's all types of shirk. Now, there's a different part. All types of shirk. So, in the Meccan Surah, we're going to see all types of shirk mentioned. Why? Anybody tell me why? Why do you think a lot of all the different types of shirk are mentioned in the Meccan Surahs? That's because that's, that's, what, that's, what, they they were that's what they were doing. So, they're pulling it to, they're bringing it, we're going to get to it because they're bringing it to the, the attention of the person that's doing it. Sometimes people do things droning along and they're not paying attention to what that actually means, right? And why, they, why am I doing this? They might say to themselves. And when someone mentions it to them, and then they can reflect, and maybe in on their own, come back. And we, we hope that people come back and follow the proper deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inspiration for good work. And inspiration for good work. Again, and inspiration, inspiration for good work. So here, you're, we're being inspired to do good deeds. Amalu salih. No real actions are being told, specifics, okay? Just do good. Why is that? Because, because the salah is not yet. No, all the different acts of the sharia have not been established yet, okay? So there's, an, there's a buildup. Now this is another reason why we say learning the surahs and learning the Quran are two different things, okay? Because when you, once the Qur'an was finished, in the order that we have it in, it is a miracle. And when it was coming down, it was miraculous. So it's an ongoing miracle in every aspect that it came. And this is why they call it inimitable. It's unable to be, you know, imitated. You can't count the way, many ways that it is blessed. And so they can't fade it. Okay? They can't do it. No, they can't do it. So in the way when we study it, we study it from the way that we call it al-arad al-akhir, the last exposure. 
Okay, when Jibreel would, took the Prophet Muhammad and tested him the last time and recited to him the last time twice, right? And so the order that he did it with Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Muhammad, that's the order that we have the Qur'an now. Because some people, some of the mustashriqeen, the, 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 the Masonic groups and these people, they say, oh, you guys put that Qur'an together, your own selves, and you put the long surahs to the last one. Don't, don't even let that touch your heart, okay? Because it's a lie. <laughs> we have this famous narration where the Prophet Sallallahu recited the Qur'an to Jibreel the last time and he did it twice. What order do you think he put it in? And how do we know what order he put it in? Zayd was with him. And this is why Zayd was picked, Zayd ibn Thabit was picked by the Sahaba to gather the Qur'an both times. Because he was there. He was an eyewitness. And so he knew in which order it should be in. And all the ayat that will remain. Does that make sense? Yes. We have everything laid out. Walhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, an inspiration for good work. So at this time, no good deed, no, no actual events, uh, events are being told, actions and ibadat are actually being really enforced on people. Salah does come, but at first thing is just be righteous, figure it out, start doing amal salihat. About the rising from the grave, the rising from the grave. As if we knew then we'd behave. As if we knew then we'd behave. Because that's the that's the intention there. That if someone is told that there is a yawmul akhir, there is a hisab coming, there isn't a day of accounting coming, then he might act right, she might act right. Because if you think you want to get away with this, okay, I understand it. But did you realize you gonna have to you ain't getting away with this? No one gets away with it. Eventually you have to pay. Now or later. And if you pay later, the latter, right? Our appointment, because sometimes the kuffar, they inspire um, ignorant Muslims, Muslims with a lot of zeal, okay, and energy, to want to do something, they, they go them into a fight. They kill some Muslims, and then some other Muslims go and want to kill them back, you know, and they commit crimes. They say, oh, look, they're terrorists, right? And you ask these Muslims, what the hell, what's wrong with you? Why do you do that? And they say, we want to get revenge for, you know, for all the things they do. We, 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 don't, we don't have no revenge to get here. The sa'a. Our appointed time is the hour. And it's a shaddu wa amr. And it is going to be more severe and more bitter at that time. So this is what the Muslims should feel at ease for. It ain't nobody getting none. Allah is al adl Okay? So this shouldn't allow you to, to go beyond what your rights are. And, and then become commit dhulm yourselves. You know, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. It's only due to ignorance that anybody does anything outside of the Sharia. Or non-acceptance of the knowledge, which makes it juhud. Conscious unacceptance is kufr. So, about the rising from the grave. About the rising from the grave. As if we do, as if we knew then we'd behave. As if we knew then we'd behave. Surahs that made men reflect. Surahs that made men reflect. And their minds could not reject. And their minds could not reject. We have to stop here now. Surahs that made men reflect. Now look at that. These surah. Were they not, not trying to listen? Remember, they, weren't, they didn't want to listen to these surahs. So Allah designed us, right? Qaddarana. He created us and designed us. He knows how to get our attention. He knows what to do that's going to automatically, because he created us. And he designed us to respond to that real easy, right? Turn, oh, we got to listen to that. What? Now we're listening even though we said we wasn't going to listen to that. And this is another reason we find a shorter style you'll find with them. Short surah. Because they didn't want to listen. So it's, they hit and it's gone. Man, what, and, they, and they already heard it. Does that make sense? Yes. It's made the mind reflect. So now they're thinking on that all day. Now they're pondering over what was said. Even though, and it's eating up, obsessing their minds. And it's working on it. You can't hide from the truth that's made evident. Evidence. 
And their minds could not reject. That's another aspect of it. And their minds could not reject. Hulu. And their minds could not reject. So even after pondering over it, their minds could not reject what was said. There are three types of statements. How many types of statements are there? Three. three. Period. In the world, in existence, there are only three types of sentences. One type of sentence is a logical sentence. What type? Logical. A logical sentence is a sentence that your mind cannot reject. You cannot reject the logical sentence. It's not, does it make sense? No, your mind cannot reject that sentence. It's a logical sentence. You only have one mother. Can your mind reject that? No. The ladies are looking around with their guns. <laughs> We're the first person to say yeah. It's a privilege. <laughs> That's right. You only have, that, that's a logical sentence. Two men got into a car accident. One died. One did not. Logical? Can you reject that? That's the, the criteria. Can your mind reject it? No. no. There's a second type of sentence. It's called a researchable sentence. Some people call it empirical. A researchable. What type of sentence? Researchable. This is the, there's another type of sentence. This researchable sentence is anything someone says that we can go and check it out and find out if it's true or not. Like I, I, the, the light right here, there's a, some gas in there, right? And there's two little pieces of cheap metal that, that when they heat, get an electrical current, they heat up and they glow. And inside that glass, that glass that's, that's airtight, that gas in there glows and we get light. Or someone took some of those bugs, those love bugs out there, and they stuck them in there and they light up. <laughs> We can research that, right? <laughs> Crack the glass and the little bugs come flying out. <laughs> but it's researchable. It's researchable. Right. Allah uses in the Quran logical statements. Okay? Mostly in the Meccan surahs. Logical statements that the mind cannot reject. That's one of the criteria. When you look at that, now you think about that. There's only three types of sentence. What's the third type of sentence? Legal sentence. What is it? Legal, legal, sentence. legal statement, I should say. A legal statement. What's a legal statement? A law. A law. A law from the lawgiver. Because I can make up laws. It ain't a, it's not a legal statement. It has to come with authority, right? Yes. So like here in, in North Carolina, you have legislators. They have determined that we will drive on green and we have to stop on red, right? That is a, does it have to make sense? No. 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 I think it's better to, to go on the red because it's telling you warning, go ahead, be careful, right? Or maybe we should go on yellow, but can I change that law? No. Every time I get red, I, you know, I start, man, it makes more sense to me. It doesn't have to make sense, the legal statement. It doesn't have to make, when I say sense, it doesn't have to make physical, scientific sense to us, right? It doesn't have to do that. It doesn't mean, we can't say, okay, why five salah? We should have stayed with 50. It's not our choice. It's whatever a law determined. That's a legal statement. Whatever the, what is legitimately from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's a legal statement. And it holds the weight of the lawgiver. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those are the three types of statements that you'll find in the Qur'an. Look for them. This is a general statement I've given you, which is tafsir for 6,000 plus by all accounts. Then after that, we all have doubts. It's 6,000 plus ayah. So now you can use this in every one of those ayah. And that's the benefit of studying tafsir. So now when you, you've been given the authority by Allah to to, to, dubber, to think and ponder over the Quran. What do you ponder over? These things I just mentioned. What type of ayah is it? Is it a legal statement? Is it a, is it a logical statement? Is it an empirical, meaning a researchable statement? That's what you ask yourself. Does that make sense? Yes. 82 before migration, Meccan surah sparked the nation. Providing to tell the law and not to worship. That's Prophet Saints, all types of shirk and inspiration. Keep going. About the rising from the grave. About the rising from the grave. As if we knew that we behave. Surahs that may be. Come on, guys, you sound terrible. Surahs that may reflect and their minds could not reject. Did ladies, did you guys write it down? Yes, it's ready. 
You can't see it too good? Then recite it slow again. We're going to recite it so everybody can write it down. Okay? 82 before migration. 82 before migration. Meccan Surah sparked, sparked the nation. Meccan Surah sparked the nation. Inviting to Tawheedullah. Inviting to Tawheedullah. And not to worship Awliya. And not to worship Awliya. That's Prophet, Saints, all types of shirk. That's Prophet, Saints, all types of shirk. And inspiration for good works. And inspiration for good works. About the Rising from the grave. About the rising from the grave. As if we knew, then we'd behave. As if we knew, then we'd behave. Sorters that made men reflect. Sorters that made men reflect. And their minds could not reject. And their minds could not reject. I'm ready to go forward. Anybody, can I go forward? Yeah. Warnings and then punishment. Warnings and then punishment. By telling us to be patient. By telling us to be patient. Warnings and then punishment. Say it. Warnings and then punishment. Warnings. 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 And then punishment. Punishment. Punishment or punishment? Punishment while telling us. While telling us to be patient. While telling us. To be patient about the rise, about the, I'm oh, sorry, about the final day for all. About the final, final day for all. all. The final, final day for all. An open challenge. An open challenge. An open challenge. challenge. I'll repeat it again. An open challenge for an Kufa. An open, open challenge, challenge for Kufa. Uh, uh, two Kufa. I'm sorry, two Kufa. Two open two challenge for two, two Kufa. When curses and or oaths begin. 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 And or oaths. Begin. And letters. And letters. And letters. That hold secrets in. That hold secrets in. Nations past. Nations past. And prostration. And prostration. Nations past. Nations past. And prostration. And prostration. And prostration. And prostration. <coughs> Prophets gone. Prophets gone. And our creation. And our creation. Kella. Kella. With its strong negation. With its strong negation. These all came. These all came. Before migration. Before migration. Now, even though Usul Tafsir is the history, we do give some a few rules here and there for you to use as an example, as we do here. And there's another rule that you have to understand. When we say something, it's aglabiya, meaning more most of the time. Because every time we find an, a, 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 an exception, people say, I thought you said this is the majority of the time this will be the case. There's going to be exception here and here. But because something is an exception, doesn't break the rule. Does that make sense? An exception does not break the rule. So these are the rules. Warnings and then punishment. Warnings and then punishment. There's a lot of warnings in the Meccan surahs. Because you've got to remember what's, being, what's happening here. People are being called. And then they're being threatened. Okay? And then they're being told, hey, I'm telling you this, there's going to be a punishment. If you don't follow, it's going to be punishment. While telling us to be patient, who's us, the believers? One of the benefits of knowing the Meccan and Medinan or Medinan Surah is in its application. 
When you're reading a surah and you're trying to get the tafsir, the understanding, the context from that particular surah, if it's a Medinan surah, then you know what context to put it in. If it's a Meccan surah, you understand the context that it has come in and its application. And then you can look at your lives. Us here in the United States, what are we in? What phase are we in? Are we in a Medinan stage or are we in a Meccan stage? We're in a Meccan stage. Not that we don't have to follow the Sharia. But in the aspects of people in the Meccan stage had to take what they call Shahada to Nisa. What they call it? Shahada to Nisa. What does that mean? Pledge of the woman. The pledge, the, the, the Shahada of the women. The men had to take this pledge. Do you know what Shahada to Nisa means? What, what it implies? That there's no fighting. That the men that come to Islam, there's no fighting in, in, involved in their pledge. Where the people, when they made the pledge, to the prophet in Medina, fighting, defending, was part of the pledge. That's why when the prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr showed up, what did they first go do? They went and got their weapons on. And they rode out there to meet him to show we are ready to fulfill our pledge. Okay? When they got to uh, Ohad, he said, maybe you think they're gonna, we're going to tell them like they told, you know, the other people that, you know, you and your, 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 you and you, Musa, you and your, your, your Lord, you go to fight. No, we got you. We're here with you. We're going to keep our pledge in that regard. But that was in the Medinan stage. Why is that vital? Again, to prevent some of the foolish things that happen when people, the Muslims, get twisted on what we're supposed to be focusing on in our situation. Okay? In the context of the fit that we're supposed to be applying under the circumstances that we find ourselves in today. And fit changes from place to place. The best example of that is Imam al-Shafi'i. When he moved from Damascus into Egypt, he changed his whole fit. And they said, what's going on? You know, you Shafi, man. You know, he said, hey, I'm not, I'm not Damascus, from Mecca, I'm sorry. From Mecca to uh, Egypt, Egypt, he changed his fit. He said, hey, I'm not, I'm not there anymore. I'm here. You can't ask me, I can't, personally, just here in the United States, you can't expect me to act like I do act in New York City, down in North Carolina. That'd be crazy. New York has a 45 second minute, you know? <laughs> North Carolina has a 75 second minute. <laughs> There's a humongous difference, you know? There's a big difference in that. <laughs> no, no, no questions yet, inshallah. Warnings and then punishment by telling us to be patient because they're in a particular circumstance. And so fit is to look at why he, they did such a thing. So not only what did they do, why did they do it? So we can, if we find ourselves under those circumstances, we do that why. Or fulfill that objective of the why. Okay? About the final day for all. Why is that? Why did that come in the Meccan surahs? About the final day for all. It came throughout the Quran. But particularly here because people had to learn about Hisab. They had to deal with superstitions that were existing. Okay? And so they had to destroy them. Same thing like we got now. We got voodoo. We got hopia. We got roots. We got all types of things people say they're going to do to you when they die. Right? Or when somebody else is because somebody else. We got to kill all of that. And explain what is the reality about the final day. Again, we're talking about the Sabbath. Not only that, it's a pillar. It's one of the, the, the fundamentals of our Iman. Right? The six pillars of every of, of man is about the final day. Accepting that. And we see once the Quran takes its final form, that becomes immediately, it becomes one in Surah Al-Baqarah. And not even Surah Al-Baqarah, um, Surah Al-Fatiha. We deal with that right away. Yom ad -Din. Immediately. Okay? In the order, then once you get the Baqarah, it deals with it again. So, as you said, about the final day for all, an open challenge to? Kufa. And that open challenge comes multiple times in multiple places throughout the Qur'an, this is an open challenge. Why is it a challenge for the Qur'an? I'm sorry, for the Kufa. Nobody? Because the, yes ma'am, Tahira. Yes, go ahead please. Because the Arabic was their language and they, you know, they were professionals Go ahead with your bad self, right? So she says that the Arabs, people are known by the particulars they have about themselves, right? 
when you sometimes we think about Chinese, we see Chinese food, right? Because they, they got some, they got it going on. We, so we think till you move to Asia and find it's not just Chinese food, it's all Asians got that same. But, but here we think it's Chinese food, right? And you think about that, whatever you, you call it the apple tree, because it's known for the apple. You don't call it the green leaf, right? You call it the apple and the wheat, this big thing. We call it this big old long thing, but we're talking about the little small seed. Because that's the benefit that we get out of that thing. The Arabs are known by their tongue. Al Arabiya. The word Arab in and of itself means to make something crystal clear, an emotion, a statement, to leave no doubt about a statement, a phrase, right? We can understand that. Ours is an oral tradition. We like the gift of the gab. Everybody likes balagha. What did he say? Look at how he said that. We appreciate that, okay? So the challenge is, like Antayana said, look, if you all of that, you professional speaker, then you say this is a not from Allah, then bring something with it. And look, in actuality, in the tafsir of the Qur'an, in the seek of the Qur'an, this, the, the order of the Qur'an, that is the first thing you're asked to believe in. Did you know that? After you get out of Fatiha, let's, let's travel through the Qur'an, okay? In a general terms. Al-Fatiha, the theme in Al-Fatiha, I know I'm cheating, give you a preview for, for Ramadan. Mm -hmm. The theme in Al-Fatiha is one of the themes is how to ask for help. Everybody with me? Yeah. You want guidance? I always imagine it's a cat from Harlem or Brownsville or Bed-Stuy. He believes in Allah because we got a lot of guys, they believe in Allah, but they just don't trust nobody. Okay? <coughs> Who are we going to trust? The slavers? <coughs> Jim Crow? We don't know what to believe. Reverend Porkchop? <laughs> no, no, seriously. So, so the man is like, yo, well, I believe in some, I know it's Allah, but I don't know how to get there. And I don't know what information to, to, to do. Do I trust the Arab guy? Man, he's selling pork and beer at the store. I don't trust his sincerity to tell me nothing. So what do I do? Allah answers that question in Surah Al-Fatiha. That's just one of the things he does. So we say, eh, dinner, guide us. He teaches us. And we can get into that, but I'm not going to. We move on. Baqarah starts. And the first thing it says is, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب. There's no doubt about it. Raib is different from shak. Ashukku fika. Yeah, Hanif. Hanif says it's sunny outside. I don't consider Hanif a liar, but I doubt his facts. So I say shak. But if, if, if what's the guy's name? Bush? No. Who's the guy now? Trump. 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 If Trump says that it's raining outside, I'm going to get my sunglasses. I don't trust nothing he said. Okay? He, even though he's the most honest of the politicians, you guys get my point. You know? He, he, you don't trust, you have rave for him. You doubt him personally, as opposed to doubting his facts. You can trust somebody, but doubt their facts. And that's called shak. If you have rave for somebody, even if they're telling the truth, you don't trust them. Even if you know they're telling the truth, you don't trust him why he's telling the truth. That's called rave. It's a higher level of doubt. Does that make sense, everybody? So Allah says in the very beginning, dhalika, he used dhalika, a grand term, even though it means this is, but just the same way we say, how are you? Why am I saying how are you? And are is for plural in the English language. Aggrandizing you. It's a form of complimenting you. We do it, we just don't think about it in the English language. Are is plural. The proper English phrase is how is you? As children do, because they understand it. And then we break the rules for them. So we say, how is you? How are you? Are being plural, just like we say assalamu alaikum in the plural, to be polite. So we say valley kitab because this is the epitome of the book. This is what a book is in every shape, form, or fashion. La rayba fi. No, la rayba fi, that is from Allah. So if you was doubting everybody, you had rave for everybody in the world. That's why you asked for the fatiha and the fatiha was given to you. Now you wanted guidance? Have no rave whatsoever that this is real guidance. That this is the book. So we're called to believe in the book. Right? Believe in the book that what? That is from Allah. Does that make sense? Yes. And that is what we're initially called to. Allah deals with the hearts. 
right? The first page, he deals with the heart, the believing heart, the, the, the sealed heart of the, of the Kafir, the sick heart of the, the weak-minded Munafir. And he goes on to give some examples of, of that person. Then it starts with the first order in the Quran. Ya ayyuhal nas. Oh, man, God, ain't call you believers. Ain't asking you to be a believer in everything right now, right? Oh, you a nas. Oh, people. A'budu rabbakum. Worship your Lord. Worship your Lord. Who's your Lord? Rabbul Alameen, right? He mentioned Rabbul Alameen. Now he's going to tell you who he is. Alladhi khalaqakum. He tells you five things ain't nobody else did. Walladhi nimin qablikum. He created you and those that came before you. La'allakum tattakum. So you want to get that taqwa because this book is for those who have taqwa, right? So this is la'allakum tattakum. Worship your Lord. He created you. He rej'ala lakum ul arda firasha. He's the one that made this earth for you, right? There's only two. That's two things right there. He created you, those who came before you. He sent, the, he made the earth for you. And the sama al and made the earth, the, 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 what do you call it? The gravity and the, the atmosphere for you. Other planets don't have gravity. Can't, no life, nobody's there, right? And he sent down from the sky, man, rizqan lakum for razaqakum. Right, so he provides, so he's the creator. He's the mudabbir for all your affairs, right? And he provides for you. And gives you a reason for life. For that lillahi and and you know better. So he gives you a sub up, a reason for existence here. And gives you your first negative order. Do not do this. He doesn't say make sure, right? Just don't put no competition. And you know better. He didn't say don't do this and become kafir. He's it's a real good argument, right? And then he says, Well, in kuntum fi raven. Now, if you still got rave, now here's a threshold moment. Right away. Now, if you still doubt, just after these two, three pages, if you still doubt it, that this is from all, you say you still got rain, that what we sent down on our slave, Muhammad, this revelation, because he's mentioned what came down before, right? Then you bring a sword like this then. Just like al Tahira said. Oh, if you don't believe, if you believe, just, just what you heard so far. Now you, there's a demand here that you believe in this book, okay? What do you have to believe? That we sent it, that Allah sent it down to his, to his slave. Because then right after that he says, Inna Allah. Then he says, right after that, he says, okay, if you can't do it and you'll never be able to do it, call everybody, call all your homies, all right? Call all your peoples you want to do. Do a gather convention. Do a party. You'll never be able to do it, right? And when you realize that you won't ever do it, then for taqwa, he doesn't say then go to the fire. He says have taqwa for the fire. Then do something to protect yourself from the fire, which is different than say get ready for the fire. For taqwa, then do something to watch out for this fire that's been prepared for the kafirin. That's that's prepared for those who reject. And then he gives congratulations to those who go to, who do believe in the book, right? <coughs> And then they're going to get jajannat. And he starts to explain that. Then immediately he gets a consequence of disbelief. You see the, the Quran? He says, <laughs> He says, listen up. Allah is not going to, he's going to turn over, he, you have to say, he's not going to not turn over every rock. He's going to give you an example and, and, and parable of a ba'ud, a gnat. Even as small as a gnat and anything that comes bigger than that. So whoever believed that this book is from Allah, for Yaquluna, he's gonna say, Amanabihi kulun min and bina. He's gonna say, I believe in all of it. It's all from my Lord. Get it? It's back to that Rububiya. It's back to the Lord. He's saying, This is the reason you love your mama. Why you love mama? Because she gave birth to you. She carried you, right? She did all these things, and then you hid behind her leg, and she still changed you, did all this stuff, and then put up with us until we're still, still putting up with us. You know, <laughs> in that regard, all our lives. And Allah did more than that. So the, the filial piety and attachment and, and allegiance you give your mother, you give to Allah much more. And that's why Rubabi is constantly mentioned there. Okay? It's all from our Lord. But I'm a Ladina Kafiru, but as for the Kafir for Yaqulu, the one who disbelieves that this is from Allah, who still has raib that this is from Allah, he's gonna say, Mother Allah will be have a method. What Allah mean for it? They start grabbing an ear on the other side of their head, start coming up with all types of funky ideas and, and twisting things up, saying he's agnostic, he's Muslim and Kafir, and he's all, you know, they come up with all types of weirdo nonsense. Here you hear him. You see him on the line. Now I will be left. 
Don't we see? And so this is a consequence of still having rave that the unbelief in this book. Do you guys, you guys understand that? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. We should have waited for that. But inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> <laughs> An open challenge to Kufar. That's just one of the challenges. That's just one of the reasons that 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 challenge came to the Kufar. But do you see the connection? How the Quran goes that way? It's not placed any any way. He hither tither. There's a reason. This is a complete discussion that is designed for the hearts and the minds of the man. You know, an argument that the mind cannot reject, right? And makes us reflect upon just in what we covered. We're on page four. In the Mosaf. There's 600 more pages to go. So, and it's all connected. All of it. So here, when curses and or oaths begin, say it. When curses and or oaths begin. Every surah that opens up with a curse is a Meccan surah. Understand that. When curses and or oaths begin. When letters that hold. Secrets in. Not every surah that has, has letters is a Meccan surah, but most of them are. Okay? Most of them are. And there's a reason for, that, for those, those letters too. And we'll talk about that. Somebody remind me during Ramadan to explain why these letters come because everybody says we just, we do so many zone, drone things. We say, we just repeat statements. When I was a kid, we, we had a gang, a Muslim gang. When our, in our clubhouse, to get in, you had to say the code word, right? <laughs> Hey, you know, these are the kids, you know. And the code word was, what is Tawheed? The oneness of Allah. And you could get in. But what does that statement mean, the oneness of Allah? That's not real English. You saying something, but you ain't saying nothing. You get my point? We start repeating terms that we don't even understand the meaning of. Okay? We don't say something is the oneness. Somebody, whoever said that, does not speak English. We don't say someone, how, oh, look how oneness he, 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 she looks today. We say how unique she looks today. Okay? When something is singularly amazing, it's unique. When it's one of a kind. Right? right. But we don't say, oh, how oneness that thing looks. <laughs> if we, by repeating this stuff without thinking, we might as well be zombies. Because the meaning has not, trans, has not penetrated the core. Does that make sense? And that's what I'm an enemy of. That's why I focus on tafsir. Because we have not really gone over the Qur'an. And that's why we're in the state of affairs that we are in. It's a cry for. <laughs> At any rate, when they, <laughs> I don't know how to go. Sorry. Remind me, ask me why the, what the meaning of the lesson. We just stop and say, Allah knows best. Yes, Allah knows best, but we do know what they're doing. Okay? We do know what, what they were there for. So just ask me, inshallah. <laughs> Nations past and prostration. Which is prophets gone and our creation. These two are very important. The ayat of prostration come in the Mecca source. MashaAllah. Think about that. May people bow down. Kella with his strong negation. Kella with his strong negation. Kella only comes in the Quran in the Meccan source. As many times it may come. You, if it's Kella, it's from a Meccan source. These all came before migration. migration. And we are going to become so familiar. Memorize this. So that you can become more familiar with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it can benefit. It's addictive. It's the true addiction that we're supposed to have. And it's what every crackhead is looking for. Every wino, every adventure seeker, he's looking for ibadah. He's looking for this Islam. That one peace in the heart that cannot be filled except for with Islam. True Islam. And that's why people feel unfulfilled. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.